Stories from the Crystal City is produced by the Corning Painted Post High School Learning Center in cooperation with the Corning Museum of Glass Ray Cow Research Library. The documentary captures the stories of area glass industry workers from the 1940s through the present. This remarkable project was made possible from a Save Our History grant from the History Channel. The stories of the people we've interviewed show how they got started, memories of what they did at work, connections to their family, and gratitude for their employer as well as their community. Today, Corning is still a community based firmly in the glass industry. We hope you too can appreciate our rich 150 years of glass history. My name is Becky. And I'm Alex. Welcome, Welcome to Corning. Corning. Corning is located in the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York. You can't think of Corning without thinking of glass. Corning's history has been a history of glass since 1865. Corning's glass culture has steadily increased as the years have gone by starting with one small idea that was never entirely successful, inspiring over 150 years of glass history in our community. I like to start with a painting because it shows you what Corning looks like when it was a farming community in the 1850s before anyone ever thought about glass making coming to Corning. And what you see here, the green and yellow shutters, that's why the glassworks came to Corning. A man named Elias Hungerford in 1866, who was a local man, businessman, got the idea for glass shutters, which I think were meant to be a cheap alternative for stained glass in your house. So he took out a patent on them, and he went to New York City to find a glass works to make his stained glass windows. And he talked to the people who owned the Brooklyn Flint Glass Works. That was the Houghton family, uh, Amory Houghton and his son. So Mr. Hungerford apparently said, well, if I get some financial backers, how would you like to come to Corning? And they said, sure, you, you know, get us a free piece of land, which is what Mr. Hungerford did. So they loaded all of the equipment on flat boats and sent them uh, up the Hudson River to Albany, over on the Erie Canal, and down through the extension of um, Lake Seneca to Watkins Glen. And there was an extension of the canal that fed into the Chemung River, and then they went west on the Chemung River. And it was navigable as literally as far as Corning. And that was it. They couldn't have gone any further west because the river wasn't deep enough. So they unloaded all their equipment and they built their factory. And you see the factory. The little building in the center is the building they built in 1868. So when they came to Corning, uh, John Hoare was an Englishman who had had a cutting shop in the Brooklyn factory. And he agreed to come with them to Corning and, and open a branch cutting shop here in Corning. And the business was quite successful, so he closed down the one in Brooklyn, where the rent was higher anyway, and brought all his workmen up to Corning. And then his superintendent was an Irishman named Thomas Hawks. Mr. Hawks, in 1880, split off from Hoare. So that by the 1880s, there were two cutting firms here buying blanks from the Houghtons, from Corning Glassworks. So that was what kept them going for the first 30 years they were here. Um, the blowers who came to Corning, as far as I know, were Americans. The cutters were almost all Englishmen or Irishmen who were trained as cutters and then came to this country. There weren't very many who, who apprenticed in this country. The engravers were almost all Bohemians and Austrians from, from what's now the Czech Republic. And they would get their training there. And like the cutters, they'd come here because American wages were nearly double what European wages were. So that if they could find the money for the boat ride, they could make much better wages over here. And as a consequence, there was a very heavy uh, foreign influence in Corning in the uh, last quarter of the 19th century. Corning Glass blew the first light bulbs for Edison when Edison was inventing electric light. He sent to Corning, and they made the blanks and sent them to him, and he put the wires inside. If you look at some of those boys, they look like high school students to me, except, of course, they weren't going to school. They had dropped out of school at 14 or 15, and they were working. You can see some of them are older, but some of them are quite a bit younger. Frederick Carter was an Englishman that Mr. Hawks hired to come to Corning and run his own furnace. Uh, Hawks got tired of buying his blanks from Corning. And Corning was um, going into more scientific glassware and thinking that they didn't want to make glass cutting blanks their principal business anymore. 
So Mr. Hawks hired Frederick Carter to come from Corning and make his blanks. He set up Steuben. And uh, Carter said he'd come if he was allowed to make his own things as well, because he thought making blanks was pretty boring. And he didn't want to just do that. So Hawks basically said, well, if you come and um, you know, run my factory, I'll let you do what you want. And it was kind of interesting, because in 1903, Corning Glass at that time, their factory was 30 odd years old and was kind of old fashioned. And Mr. Hawks was willing to put up the money to build a furnace of the latest fashion, uh, very efficient. So Carter went to Pittsburgh and studied furnaces and looked at the most, the newest design in furnaces. And then he came to Corning and the Steuben factory, which opened in 1903, had the most modern factory in New York State and the most efficient. So Frederick Carter was a really interesting man. He was about 40 when he came to Corning. And as I said, he uh, was hired by Thomas Hawks to come. He'd studied chemistry. He'd started out as a designer. And he designed the shapes of almost all the glass they made, which was something like 2,000 different designs. He experimented with the color formulas and got a lot of different color and techniques. Mr. Carter finally retired. In, in 1918, um, the Hawks, Mr. Hawks sold the company to the Houghtons. And the Houghtons sort of took over. And uh, so he was. He ran the factory in the 1920s, and then in the 1930s, when they decided to do colorless glass, he was made design director for Corning, and he designed things like architectural tiles and things. And he finally retired when he was in his 80s. The museum was started when he was in his 90s, and so one of the first exhibits the museum did was a um, review of Frederick Carter's work, which he was pleased with because no one had paid him. He was 96 by that time, and no one had paid any attention to him for the past 20 years. So he was very happy to have his work in the museum, and as a consequence, he gave us a lot of his things. Uh, well, I said, I played golf with Fred Carter uh, for 25 years, and I never, I wasn't interested in Steuben. I thought Steuben was just color, or just plain crystal. Uh, every Thursday evening at 8 o'clock, I'd come up to see Mr. Carter and bring maybe 20 pieces of glass and have him identify it if it had this is Steuben. Sometimes I'd show him a, a beautiful piece of Tiffany and he'd say, Bob, you knew I wouldn't make anything like that. Then we get a piece of Virtus La, uh, just a kind of simple, nice piece of Steuben. He'd look at it and say, isn't it, that's nice, isn't it? After, and he was 97. Oh, at that time, I thought if he lived to be a hundred, I had three years to learn more about glass from a man that probably knew more about our class than anybody in the world. So I wanted to get show him as many pieces as I could, and so I bought it a lot of it. One day he said, "You know how many pieces that I've identified for you?" He said, "Well." Uh, he said, you, you bring up maybe 15, 20 pieces. You know, uh, I think that in these last three years, I've identified and signed at least 2,000 pieces. So I, and uh, so I probably sold 10,000 pieces and uh, given another 5,000 pieces to the Rocco Museum. And that collection now if you want to see probably the most beautiful exhibit of, of glass in the world is the Carter Steuben Gallery, which is uh, over in the Corning Museum of Glass area. <laughs> Corning's glass industry was firmly established by the early 20th century, providing opportunities for locals as well as a destination for glass specialists from all over the globe. I came to Corning in 1940 or 41 uh, with a, a degree from MIT in physical chemistry and my work for many years was to try to invent new kinds of glass and study the high temperature chemistry of glass. When I received my degree uh, I was looking for a job and this was a very poor economical time, so in one way I was just looking for any kind of a way to make money. And uh, glass 
did intrigue me because I did, didn't know anything about it. I thought this might be a, a field that uh, where I could learn something new and invent things that had not seen been seen before. And I was lucky to have that be the case. I know that my interest was West Coast. I wanted to go to the West Coast and I graduated. So I interviewed only West Coast companies except for Corning. Well, I, of course, had read about him when I was in school. It was widely published and probably I read about and he, he was more of a hero to me than anybody else in the literature. So when I first came to Corning, I went to the First United Methodist Church and offered to sing in the choir and I sat next to this roly-poly guy and told him my name was John Brown. I was just had been hired at Corning. I was working at Corning Incorporated and going to go to this church. And he said, well, my name is Don Stuckey. I said, wow, this is the man that I had idolized you know, all these years, and here he sings tenor and the church choir where I'm going to sit. So I got to know him immediately at that point. In ni late 1966, I transferred back to Corning, New York as the general sales manager. Um, and that career was spent, except for one year, all in the electronics division, which was a, a very different operative than most of the company as it related to the manufacture of uh, glass or glass technology. Um, I have been with Corning for about 40 years now, and uh, specifically I work with the materials that Corning develops and invents, such as glasses and glass ceramics and ceramics. Well, I was born in Corning. Then I lived about a block from the glass works. I lived there all my life. And I, I always kept watching them work over there when I was a little kid. I figured someday I'd want to get a job there. And that's what happened. I just went to school after I started school. I, was, I went to the second year high and I had to leave because my brother died and I had to take care of our family for a while for about four years and I, I took and I went to work in the glass works and I got a job there and I finally I got a job in a factory. So I wrote to uh, uh, Aura Force in Sweden, uh, in Germany, in Switzerland and then Stuban. And even though I didn't speak any English, the, you know, Stuben sounded like the best place to go. So I came over here and uh, they hired me, uh, you know, on scene. Uh, and I came here in 57. And the first thing that happened to me, I got drafted in the Army. So I had to <laughs> serve in the American Army for a while until the company tried to get me out of the army to get in the National Guard, which they did then later, so I finished serving my duty there in the National Guard. Oh, I was born on October the 25th, 1919. I had a half-brother and a half-sister. I had a, a full sister and a full brother, and myself. My father, he was uh, 60 years old when I was born. My mother, she was about 25. Well, of course, I started out in the labor gang, in the mixing room. And then uh, I went in service for 39 months. When I come out of service, I went in the millwright shop. And I was there until I retired in 1978. Well, started in 1941. I wasn't even 18 yet. I lied my age, <laughs> like I lied my age when I joined the Air Force. I already knew how to fly. <laughs> and uh, then I finally got a job at Corning, and I w worked in a factory. I was go to the employment office, and they weren't hiring. So my father knew the guy who was did the hiring, and he talked to him. <laughs> so he said, Tell him to go in at midnight tonight. If the boss puts him to work, he has a job. So that's how I got my job. I uh, I think I worked maybe 
about a year, I got bumped once, and I heard about the stew band, and I went up to see the boss, and he transferred me in. And then they kept moving me up as I learned. Uh, my father, of course, I knew well, uh, and uh, uh, he was a great influence on me, and I think uh, one of the reasons that I worked for Corning is because of him. And he, I, I have to say that he never told me that I had to work for Corning, never once. But somehow it got in the blood. It get, gets, gets to you. And uh, so here I am, and, and, uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that, uh, that I'm working for a great company and that I'm following a person like my father and my brother Amo. So, you know, that's, uh, people ask me that, and I, I'm just delighted that I came back to Corning and started working here and have been here ever since, so I'm very happy. The glass industry has provided a wide variety of jobs, not only pertaining to the creation of glass, but requiring a diversity in glass-related professions. This diversity provided the support and innovation necessary to bring glass and corning into the 21st century. I made, uh, I made snails. I made uh, little brandy, three-inch brandy glasses, about that high. And then I used to make liqueur glasses that with the air twist stem. I even made, uh, I made a pair of candlesticks for Queen Elizabeth's daughter. I got married, Annie. They put gold cups in them. All I had was a few uh, laboratory ovens uh, that would uh, go in temperature up to about 600 degrees centigrade. And the, uh, the, the uh, daily habit was for me to uh, write recipes for nine different glass compositions and uh, give them to a, 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 a reti almost retired uh, uh, glass worker. The next morning uh, he would uh, bring me back either canes or flat plates that had been made from my, my melts. and. Uh, I would have the physical properties measured, the softening temperatures and expansions and this sort of thing. And the plate on the, on the top is called polychromatic glass. It's uh, actually uh, capable of producing photographs and, and the whole color spectrum, full color photographs. Uh, with a system that uh, even Kodak doesn't doesn't know how to reproduce, all of these photosensitive glasses are have the have an advantages over other photographic systems in that the, they're permanent. They'll be their colors will be like this a thousand years from now. That's uh, something I'm proud of. Well, yes, I'd wait till the glass come up to me all from the server, and he'd have it half partially made. He shapes it for me, and he hands it to me, and I finish it for the market. When I get done with it, it's gone. It goes to the market. Well, when I was there, they had enough help that, that if a man was sick on a shop, he would go home sick or he couldn't come the next day. They would get a guy off the floor and set him in his place and give him experience on a job. You know, they set him in there till he'd work there till the guy come back. And, but of course, they had to go according to union too. You just couldn't put anybody there. But that's, that's the way it was experience on a job. That's the way they would teach you from one job to another. See, when we worked a job, we worked it. We worked eight hours a day, but four hours on one job, and four hours on a different job. We get a different blueprint, and we worked like that. So it would be monotonous. You get a big ball of glass, and 
to get it on an iron and the server would get it for me and shape it. Then he would hand it to me and then I would finish it for finished product and put the stem on it and send, get it made and send it in. So when I first went in the factory, I paid 50 cents an hour, but then it gradually went up. I think mine ended up $15 an hour. Well, a millwright would do with iron about the same as a carpenter would with wood. You do welding, cutting with acetylene torch. You do bench work. You fabricate steel. I think there are several projects that I have worked here that are uh, that have impact on society at large, and that's what's most rewarding. Uh, one of those uh, happens to be exploration of space, and you saw some pictures of the space windows, space shuttle. Uh, and the space station that's coming up soon. The other one has to do with optical fiber. We developed fiber, op fiber optics here to transmit light so that our communications will someday, well, already uh, through telephony, uh, is through a, a light as a medium rather than electrons as a medium like copper wire. Uh, another project that impacts society at large is to clean our air, our environment, particularly emissions coming from automobiles, buses, trucks, you name it. Even stationary sources like power generation equipment. So I worked on a project that Corning is quite well known for, honeycomb ceramics, and that has been also a great source of pleasure for me. Yeah, what I really liked, uh, what I really enjoyed in Stuben was doing one-of-a-kind pieces. We did many one-of-a-kind pieces, and I was very fortunate to do quite, you know, maybe 80% of them. And those are really exciting. They take a lot of time to do, but they're really, you know, the top, the top of, of the skill level. And so we did some really outstanding pieces for uh, either celebrities or politicians or just a speculation. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that was an interesting piece. That was. Uh, not planned as such. It was designed by, by a professor of architecture at Cornell, Sevi Bloom. He designed the piece, and Stuben bought the whole concept, and they made the special piece. It was an oval bowl, and I engraved all the figures. There's like 60 figures on the top in Hochschnitt, or which is called a cameo cutting. And all these figures were around the top rim of it with the king departing in the center. And it was exhibited in, on, in the store on Fifth Avenue at the time in New York. And I guess the Reagans were shopping for a gift for, you know, Di and Charlie. And they saw this piece and they thought this was the ideal piece to give them because it's a king and his whole entourage around the boat. And that's how this piece became the wedding gift. The lives and families of these individuals have been greatly impacted by the careers that they have chosen. Well, my family, uh, uh, we're all locals. I mean, uh, my, my great-great-grandfather uh, started, started in the glass business in 1851 uh, in Somerville, Massachusetts and then uh, eventually wandered down to Brooklyn, New York, and then wandered up here to Corning in 1868. And we've been here ever since, so. My father worked for Corning. My mother worked for Corning during the war. This is a company that for me gave a lot. Um, I had little to offer and much to gain. And that whole realization flowed over to my family, wherein my family uh, became an integral part of the community and the education process. And uh, from that, from their early beginnings to the time when they finished grad school, it was the uh, 
It was the imprint of the corporation and the imprint of the community and the education process that uh, allowed for them to be successful. And I think that's the happiest uh, memory that I have. I think my family has been very supportive. Uh, my wife, my children, they understand the demands uh, on their father. Uh, of course, I also had to travel quite a bit. Uh, around the world to help out customers and train them and so forth. But uh, my wife in particular uh, has noticed and spoken out ask asking me often, who are you married to, Corning or me? <laughs> and obviously uh, my answer is I get pleasure out of both. Ye you have to have passion for something that you really love and do. And that's what I told her, I have passion for both. A lot of the company chairman, you know, they live in a sort of a community that's far from their work. They get in a limousine and go to work and then they get in a limousine and go back home. Uh, whereas here in Corning, we're all in it together. Uh, my, my best example of that is, uh, is Wegmans. You know, I go down to Wegmans on a Saturday morning and I'm liable to run into people like Bob Miseraka or other people <laughs> who give me a lot of junk about what's right and wrong <laughs> with the company. So you get a reality check by being here and, and, and we're all in it together, which is nice. Corning Glassworks, now known as Corning Incorporated, has been and continues to be a pillar in the community. I've been very fortunate. Everything that I worked on, starting from television to the space windows, to the fiber optics, to display glass, uh, each, each of the projects has brought a new challenge. How do you make this better? Or how do you make it work? How do you make it durable and reliable? After all, a consumer, when you go buy something and pay big bucks, you want to get quality. And that's what we shoot for, is quality. Well, I think we've, we've valued the relationship uh, uh, with, with our workforce, uh, whether they be hourly, weekly, monthly people. And, uh, and we've had an extraordinary relationship with Local 1000 here in, here in Corning. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, we've argued about a lot of things, but at the end of the day, we always get together. If you were to, if you were to take a look at the amount of money and people that this corporation allocates to the, to the employees in terms of their development, their selection, their promotion. Um, it's significant. And having said that, the employees return that investment in terms of new products, new ideas, and new expectations. And this is a, a wonderful city. I mean, it's a, just the right size. And we have so much here and so many great people. We have the glassworks. And they are, we have uh, the Houghton family here. They've been here for 150 years. And they've done so much for Corning. And uh, just an example, when we had the big flood, uh, it looked like uh, things were pretty well over with. Uh, I know in the store, uh, I thought, well, this is the end uh, because uh, besides owing $100,000 uh, and all our merchandise and accounts receivable, the merchandise was destroyed. The people that owe us money, they all been under the flood and they didn't have any money. But the Holton family and the Glassworks came to our rescue, and we, and we turned out better than ever. And this is just, just a wonderful, wonderful community. And we have the college here, which is, which is a wonderful place. And uh, I recommend anybody who wants to live nice come to Corning to live.
Corning's rich history is evident in the glass culture found in the city today. In addition to Corning Incorporated, the area's largest employer, Corning has many glass-related businesses, from the world-famous Corning Museum of Glass and the Rakow Research Library to the many studios and art glass shops found in the city. Everywhere you look, one is bound to find reminders of our glass history and influence. Corning is a mecca for glass workers and collectors worldwide. We've learned a great deal from this project. The lives of the men we've interviewed are a part of our rich local history, and we are proud to be able to preserve their stories forever. The gratitude you're about to see expressed for our community as well as the Houghton family shows our newfound appreciation for our city. We are fortunate to be a part of a community held together by glass. Here's a great example of mutual gratitude as Dr. Stuckey explains in his interview that Corning gave him a one-year paid sabbatical to recharge his career. I think I was about 50 years old and was getting tired and running out of ideas. And uh, my boss uh, made a decision which I thought was, was critical of, of what I was doing. And so I agreed with him and decided to retire. So I wrote him a retirement letter. But he wouldn't accept it, and they, we went to the the Houghtons, and uh, they wouldn't accept it either. They gave me a year off with pay to see whether I'd change my mind, <laughs> which is very nice of them. The greatest joy was in the people I worked with, and 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 in hoping to, that we'd all work together towards a common goal. Uh, and that was really, really important for me. And uh, so I enjoyed that very much. You can't be a CEO without being a people person, I don't think, or you can't be a very good one. <laughs> it's basically the people, the management, and let's not forget this. This is critical. The contributions made by the Houghton family. And they are the most humble family and have given so much for so long that uh, their imprint on not only the corporation but the community will be lasting. I'm sure it will. No, it's, that's all I can add is it was a good job and it was a good living. And, and, uh, paid well and it was really good. I look forward every morning to going to work. Uh, it, it gives me personal pleasure to do something that is useful, that helps not only the society at large, but also Corning, because Corning has been very good to me throughout these 40 years and continues to be good to me. So I'm very happy about that. I told my wife more than once the best thing that ever happened to me was when I went to Corning Glassworks. I had all the library, the schools, and the churches. See, I, the future's great. I, I think it's, uh, and we got this great community college, and I don't know a better place. <laughs> it's, it's proud, you're, you're proud to be part of it.